Animations in this video are provided by viewers like you- I mean, Tyler Addison and Adam Midsook. Follow them on their accompanying socials in the description or at the end of this video. I haven't yet decided where I'll put them. The largest animals to ever walk the face of the planet were the sauropod dinosaurs. Known for their long necks and enormous sizes, the sauropods lasted from the late Triassic to the late Cretaceous. They're one of the longest lived groups of non-avian dinosaurs. It should therefore come as no surprise that some groups diverged from the generic body plan of super long neck, super long tail, teeny tiny head, and thick, robust body. One of these cringy influencers sported a mohawk of forward pointing spines erupting from a short neck. Meet Bahadasaurus. Just thought I'd annoy the shit out of you nitpickers really quick before we get into the nitty gritty. If you're looking for some paleo themed gifts for the upcoming holidays, I just added a metric crap ton of designs to the Edge Redbubble site, including more Spinosaurus, Hogfish, Warm Hot Bird Shit, Diplocalus, and more. Follow the link in the description and the end of this video for some awesome stuff. Back to your regularly scheduled Dino Fest. Argentina is chock full of unusual animals. The fossil record is stuffed to the gills with organisms unlike those found elsewhere. The recent past, and even the present, is also guilty of this. Modern Argentina is home to llamas, which have since gone extinct in North America, jungle cats like jaguars, giant carrion feeders like the Andean condor, and even penguins along the coast. Going to the distant past is always a great trip when in Argentina. Whether you want to find the largest animals to ever walk the planet, the largest carnivorous animals that ate them, or any of an indomitable list of other weirdos. This list of oddballs gained a new edition in 2019, and it literally flipped the script on armored longnecks. In the southern part of the Neoquén province, in the Neoquén Basin in Patagonia, Argentina, resides a layer of rock which has been bestowed the name Bajada Colorada. This formation of consistent layers has been dated to the Lower Cretaceous period, about 145 to 132 million years ago. Dr. Pablo Gaina, a researcher with the National Council for Scientific and Technical Research at the Maimonides University in Buenos Aires, was the first to find a set of teeth eroding out of the Bajada Colorada in 2010. Though this area and layer of rock is relatively rich in fossils, most of them are rather fragile. Dr. Gaina took a team from the National Council for Scientific and Technical Research to excavate the find. They knew there were more bones than just teeth, but since the bones in this area are prone to breakage, the team decided to just excavate around the bones until they had a giant rock block containing whatever bones were attached to the teeth. Once the bone block was wrapped in copious amounts of creamy, white, dripping wet plaster soaked burlap, it was allowed to harden and was then broken from the earthen pedestal it rested on during excavation. The whole kit and caboodle was taken back to the dingy laboratories at the Maimonides University in Buenos Aires. Four years of painstaking, nitpicking unearthed a lot more than just teeth. Gradually, more teeth were exposed, as well as a nearly complete lower jawbone, a majority of the pieces of the skull proper, and a few neck vertebrae. Though not a substantial find, the bones that were excavated from the block were highly unusual. The fossil record is hampered by a bunch of factors, but one of the biggest ones is preservation bias. Preservation bias is basically just the factors influencing the potential for an organism to become fossilized. Certain animals are more or less likely to become fossilized after death depending on a huge number of variables. Size, diet, ecology, anatomy, environment, and more all play a part. Small animals are made up of relatively fragile bones that can be quickly and easily decomposed. However, if the body is quickly buried, most of those bones are preserved. When it comes to giant animals, their bones are so big that they easily survive decomposition to become buried and fossilized, but are more likely to be broken apart and scattered prior to fossilization. Some parts of the body are more likely to do this than others. 
For the sauropod dinosaurs, the biggest, heaviest, most fused bones are the ones which survive the best, like the pelvis, shoulder blades, femurs, humeri, and vertebrae. The body parts, which fossilize least often, seem to be the head, followed by the teeny bits from the end of the tail, claws, and other tiny pointy bits. This means there really are a minority of sauropod dinosaurs found with skull pieces intact. The heads of famous long necks like Apatosaurus, Diplodocus, and Brachiosaurus are only known because there's so many specimens of the animal found over the last couple hundred years. In all that excavation, there's still only like one to three skulls known per genus, all of which are fragmentary. The true irony is when only the head or head end of a sauropod dinosaur is found. And this is one of those cases. The skull and bits of neck vertebrae uncovered from Bajada, Colorado were given the name Bajadasaurus pronuspinex, which comes from the roots Bajada, after the place it was found, Soros, meaning lizard or reptile, the Latin pronus, meaning bent over forward, and the Greek spinax, meaning spine. Together, this chimera of three languages translates to our fourth English as reptile from Bahada with bent over forward spines. Boy, does that epithet ring true. The skull is relatively complete. The entire lower jaw was preserved. This includes a total of three bones per side. This bit here, the dentry. This chunk up here, the serangular. And this bottom piece, the angular. The skull preserves the front bit here, called the maxilla, and the back of the skull. The back of the skull is made up of a handful of fused bones. Let's take a closer look. This splint of bone that borders the eye socket is called the lacrimal. Then comes the frontal bone and the orbitosphenoid, the parietal, postorbital, paroccipital process, pterygoid down here, the squamosals, quadratojugals, and quadrates that connect to the lower jaw. That's a lot of unnecessary anatomical vocab words, but they become rather important when you describe a dinosaur you found. Thankfully, most researchers are never alone on any given project, so if you don't know all the bone anatomy by heart, chances are someone else on your team will, and you can rely on their knowledge. Science is always collaborative. Let's move on from the skull. Three vertebrae were found with the noggin. The first two vertebrae, the atlas and axis, aren't unusual. They're simply the vertebrae which connect the skull to the neck. The third vertebra in the block was likely the fifth vertebra of the neck, and is the thing the critter was named after. The main body of the vertebra, called the centrum, isn't highly unusual for a sauropod. They all had a lot of struts and cavities to help them keep their weight down, but sprouting from the top of the vertebra, as you can see, were two super thin neural spines. The only other sauropod dinosaur with spines like this is a Margosaurus, also from Argentina and the early Cretaceous period. Turns out Bajadasaurus is a close relative to a Margosaurus as well, so the punk spines check out. A Margosaurus had its spines swept backwards like a mullet, whereas Bajadasaurus did the opposite. Its spines were swept forward like a mohawk. Despite what little remains were found of Bahadasaurus, the researchers were able to configure the beast as part of the sauropod dinosaur family Dicreosauridae. The Dicreosaurids were a group of sauropods that did things way differently. Instead of enormous bodies pushing the limits of physics, and instead of super long necks for mowing down any tree in sight, the Dicreosaurids specialized in short necks, small size, and robust neck vertebrae. They originated in the mid to late Jurassic period with members from North America, like Suasia and Dislocosaurus, from Asia, like Wingulong, from South America, like Brachytrachelopon, and from Africa, like Dicreosaurus itself. As the Jurassic transitioned to the Cretaceous period, the longer-necked Dicreosaurids went extinct, and left behind the short-necked forms, like Amargosaurus, Pilmatoya, Amarga Titanus, and of course, Bahatosaurus as the last survivors in the isolated continent of South America. It was here where they took the place of stegosaurs, ceratopsians, and ankylosaurs, since these dinosaurs never made it to South America. With its relatives identified, how would the punk rock long neck look? Since there's no body, the whole appearance of the beast is largely speculative. As it's relatively close in time and space to Amargosaurus, and is a close relative, it can be reasonably assumed Bahadasaurus had a similar body plan as Amargosaurus. 
This is even more likely since sauropods tend to have similar body plans throughout smaller evolutionary groupings, like the short-necked dicreosaurids. For example, attached to the neck was probably a wide-set torso full of vats of acid for breaking down all manner of vegetation. It held itself up with four columnar limbs capped with a single fat spur-like claw on the front foot, and two or three outwardly bent claws on the hind foot. Amargosaurus, and all dicreosaurids for that matter, are unique among sauropods for another often overlooked characteristic, their back vertebrae. At about the middle of the back, the neural spines form a spoon, paddle, or pedal shape. These weird neural spines are comparatively the tallest neural spines in any group of sauropods, often being four times as long or tall as the center of the vertebra. Dr. Darren Nash discussed the paddle-shaped spines which belong to Amargosaurus on the science blog Sauropod Vertebrae Picture of the Week. His research found the double spines of the neck shrink and then fuse together to form the paddles, from the start of the neck to the end of the tail. All of the dicreosaurids had this condition. Many of the dicreosaurids lacked the long, thin, neural spines of Amargosaurus and Bahatosaurus, however and instead had shorter, blunter neural spines. All of them had these spines divided in two though, a condition called bifurcation. It's safe to reason Bihotosaurus would have had similar paddle-shaped vertebrae in the same overall part of the spinal column. These dinosaurs were also diplodocoids. As such, most of these animals had long tails with a thick, heavily muscled base, quickly thinning out to a long rod or whip-like tail. Amargosaurus and the rest of the Dicreosaurids had these tails, so it's also safe to assume Bahatosaurus did too. I've been neglecting the neck for a while now, so it's time we took a look. The Bahatosaurus descriptors have reasoned that most of the neck vertebrae should have spines similar to the only known fifth vertebra. This would mean the animal had a neck of long forward pointing spines, forming a fence-like mane of thorns. Clearly, the exact length, shape, and how extensive the spines were is an unknown. But surely the animal wouldn't have had only two spines on one part of the neck, especially considering what it's related to. Biggest question needing an answer here is why it had these spines. Due to the fragmentary nature of the one and only specimen, you will have to infer a lot of information based on good ol' Amargosaurus, as well as your regular old modern analogs. Many studies have been done on the relatively complete remains of Amargosaurus as to the purpose of its spines. Many animals were compared to it to pin down an answer. The spines were compared to those of the Iguanodontians, a group of Ornithischian dinosaurs, as well as the keratin-covered horns of mammals, like bighorn sheep and antelope. Many Iguanodontians have similar tall neural spines. This comparison was used to hypothesize that a Margosaurus used its spines as a thermoregulatory sail, or dorsal hump, with the spines as the bony core which held up these structures. Another hypothesis suggests they may have held up a paddled crest, or were the bony cores for horny sheaths that extended the true length of the spines. All of these hypotheses, save for the last one, require the neck spines to be super strong and fully capable of resisting twists, shoves, and other physical stresses of day-to-day -day life. As it turns out, the keratinous sheath covering the last two-thirds of the spines provides a better mechanical solution against breaking the spines than the other hypotheses. The last one-third of the neural spines of Amargosaurus are covered in undulated and striated patterns. These patterns are seen in the bony cores of keratin-covered horns in living animals. This keratin-covered condition is also supported by a lack of attachment points for ligaments on the neural spines. In dicreosaurids without long spines, they have scars and depressions on the pointy neural spines which indicate they were buried under muscle, skin, tendons, and other soft tissues. This condition is missing in both Amargosaurus and Bahatosaurus. In order to decide what hypothesis best fits the appearance of the spines of either Amargosaurus or Bahatosaurus, you need to know how strong these structures are. Plenty of research has been done over the years on living examples of keratin-sheathed bony horns. It tells us bone is stronger and stiffer in passive situations, while horns and keratin-based materials are stronger 
and can resist strains and stresses in all directions. A neural spine keratin sheath is also most resistant to breakage when it's curved and much longer than the neural spine core. This is an evolutionary adaptation to protect the neural cord that runs through the hole in the top part of the vertebra. A breakage in the spines of a Margosaurus and Bahatosaurus could result in death of the animal, were it not for the most likely hypothesis of a horn-covered, non-sail-connected fence of neck spines. In living reptiles, keratin sheaths don't tend to cover 100% of the bony core, except in the Jackson's chameleon, Triosaurus jacksoni, and the plated lizards of the Gerasauridae. The discovery of Boreola pelta, which preserved the keratin sheaths and their bony cores, gives us a good ratio of keratin sheath to bony core length for dinosaurs. In Boreola pelta, the keratin extends beyond the bony core to 25% of the core's length. To improve resistance to breakage, the spines of Bahatosaurus would need to extend beyond the core to increase the overall spine length by 50%. The Bahatosaurus descriptors think the rest of the vertebrae sported spines that were longer than those preserved on the fifth vertebra. The reasoning behind this was that the spines of the fifth vertebra go far beyond the tip of the head. It makes sense that more of them would go even further to potentially create a defensive barrier. If there were any breakage to the spines, it would be restricted to the tips, thus protecting the inner spinal cord. About how big would this creature have been? Hard to say, given it's just a head and neck vertebra. But there's some reasonable speculation that can solve that question. The skull was around 40 centimeters or 15 inches long, making the whole neck somewhere around 6 to 7 feet, 1.8 to 2 meters. Since there's no body, some cues on body size have to be taken from a Margosaurus. That means a generally inaccurate but not implausible length of 30 to 40 feet or 9 to 12 meters. It might have weighed as low as 2 tons or as much as 4. It was neither the smallest sauropod nor a titanic beast that shook the earth. As Dr. Galena and colleagues speculate, the spines of Bahatosaurus and Amargosaurus may have been used in passive defense. If you're a predator, you don't want to get a face full of pointy spines. The necks of Bahatosaurus and Amargosaurus were short and would have helped the animal graze from ground level to about a little above their shoulders. Their necks were not as immobile as originally interpreted, but were far less mobile than other sauropods. As they bent down to get a mouthful of healthy, fibrous veggies, their spines would cover their heads so they could eat in relative peace. Bahatosaurus spines were particularly well equipped to deter predators from taking chunks of the delectable neck meats, whereas Amargosaurus backward pointing spines would be most useful when the neck was bent down between the forelegs, the neck spines of Bahatosaurus were effective no matter how it curled its neck. It's possible the spines could have also acted to make the animal appear larger than it is and deter attacks away from vulnerable parts. Another possible use for the spines is courtship. The bigger and longer the spines are, perhaps the sexier the males look to the females, or vice versa, who knows. We would need more Bahatosaurus material to figure that out. One other random act of anatomy I've neglected to touch on so far are the senses. Semicircular canals are ring-like structures housed in the inner ear. These structures provide an animal a sense of balance. Reconstructing those bones in extinct animals and comparing them to living animals then allows you to estimate how the animal held its head when it was alive. This analysis was done on Amargosaurus and showed the animal as habitually keeping its head pointed down to the ground, and the same was likely for Bahatosaurus. Having your face pointed downwards all the time means you cannot keep your eyes fixed forward to see any hidden predators. That is, unless you have a way around that. The eye sockets of Bahatosaurus are well preserved enough to tell us the animal had an unusual line of sight. The sockets themselves are open from the top. There were not large bars of bone, creating an eyebrow-like crest over top the eyes themselves, like in other dinosaurs. The only other animal to share this characteristic is a Margosaurus. When the head was bent down to graze, both of these animals could still keep watch with their eyes looking sideways and slightly forward, like in modern ungulate mammals. Some have argued this created stereoscopic vision in these sauropods, providing them with a good sense of depth. What kind of animals would Bahatosaurus see with those stereoscopic eyes? Bahatosaurus came from the Bahata Colorado Formation, 
This layer of rock is composed of red and green-brown sandstones and conglomerate rocks ranging from fine to coarse grain size. There are also layers of reddish claystones and light brown siltstones. It's extremely important to understand what these layers of boring rocks mean in context so you can accurately reconstruct the paleo environment in which your dinosaur lived. The layers of sedimentary rock found in this formation are indicative of braided river systems. That means the environment Bahadasaurus lived and died in would have looked similar to Madano Creek in the Great Sand Dunes National Park and Reserve, but with more contemporaneous plants. More evidence of such an environment within the rock record of Bahada, Colorado include well-preserved river channels with cross-bedding. Cross-bedding are the lines you can see right there. They are layers in the rock itself that were laid down by water or wind pushing sediments like by wind in a dune setting, or by water in a river setting. The inclined nature of many crossbeds are the result of dunes and ripples. This early Cretaceous layer of rock has also produced fossils of a few other dinosaurs. The diplodocid lion cupal was found here and described in 2014 by the same folks that found Bahadasaurus. This sauropod was very different from Bahadasaurus and wouldn't have provided a source of ecological conflict. The long-necked lion cupal would have browsed the tallest trees while Bahadasaurus was content with small trees, bushes, and perhaps ferns and other ground cover. Since this formation produces rather fragile and fragmentary fossils, no other dinosaur found in the layer is complete enough to name. That being said, remains have been found of short-skulled abelosaurid theropods and possibly dromaeosaurs. Many more unique faunas are to be found in this area, and only future digs will uncover them. Despite the fragmentary nature of this porcupine beast, the implications it raises are fascinating. What other configurations exist of the sauropod body plan? What other weird odds and ends could the long-necked dinosaurs sport? We will undoubtedly find out in due time. Post your speculations in the comment below, and thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video and share it around. Leave a comment if you like and subscribe. Hit the bell icon too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Pledge to my Patreon at any tier you like for a slew of many delicious offerings. Special thanks to patrons Dinosaur, Natty Cat, Steve Bradshaw, Thea Svensson, Arda Bayer, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Antron.